Hi, everybody. Wow, it's pretty strong. Good morning. <laughs> See, this what happened. All the people who have been ringing to Manchester, they know it's going to wake you up. So, today we're going to be talking about smart contracts, uh, which is something relatively new, but quite interesting. So, first, who am I? So, I've been to H2, H2HC a few times. Um, I'm the founder of a company called uh, Comet Technologies. We mainly focus on uh, memory forensic. I'm also the organizer of a conference in Dubai. And I mainly came in Brazil for the Picanha. So I'm sure a lot of you are doing the same if you're not from here. And uh, my recent uh, claim to fame is uh, the uh, shadow brokers called me a fun guy. So, so just so you know, uh, today we won't be talking about the internals of blockchain, we won't be talking about Merkle trees or all those things. We're mainly going to focus on Ethereum itself, smart contracts, the compiler, and the tool and framework we I'm going to be presenting today. Um, so how many of you in the room are familiar with uh, smart contracts? Just raise your hand. So I, I was pretty much the same like six months ago. Uh, living in Dubai, a lot of people talk about blockchain. And uh, then I was like, okay, why is everybody talking about it? I knew about the uh, crypto thing, you know, like the uh, Bitcoin and everything. But uh, the smart contract uh, concept itself was very new. So what's a smart contract? Uh, to make it short, basically it's a uh, software layer on top of the blockchain, which is quite interesting. And as security researchers, you know that if you have software, it means you have software vulnerabilities. So they added a new level of complexity, which is resulting in uh, security issues. So first, I'm going to describe the uh, virtual machine, which is part of Ethereum. So that's the interesting part. It's the, actually the main reason I looked at Ethereum when I realized there is an actual virtual machine in it. And we're going to see like the internals and how we can actually uh, go from the actual uh, bytecode of uh, smart contracts into something as close as possible as uh, the source code and look how we can uh, use it to analyze it to look for vulnerabilities. So first, Solidity. So Solidity is the name of the compiler for smart contracts. Um, the syntax looks very similar to JavaScript. And because of that, I decided to uh, create a tool called Porosity, which is basically like the opposite uh, in uh, chemistry slash physics classes. And Porosity is a static and dynamic uh, framework and a tool to uh, analyze smart contracts, including a decompiler. So just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar with smart contracts, so in July, the number of actual Ethereum account was around uh, 3.5 million. So now it's probably higher. And the number of contracts was around 1 million. But out of those uh, 1 million contracts, only 2,000 were verified. So what's a verified contract? It means the actual source code of that contract had been provided uh, publicly. So as you can see, 2,000 out of 1 million is not really that much. So at least it shows there is a need for reverse engineering of smart contracts. And over the summer, so we were familiar with the DAO hack that happened last year, but over the summer, since there's this new trend of ICOs, a uh, few of them have been hacked because of vulnerabilities inside smart contracts. So those were the actual, um, like, at least like the most recent issues highlighting that there, there is potential issues with smart contracts. So regarding the actual, the actual uh, Ethereum VM, so the way it works is, so each, uh, so each uh, contract can either be an account, so a, a smart contract, or just like some uh, blockchain data. A smart contract is basically a bunch of bytecode that have been compiled uh, from uh, Solidity and which is stored inside the blockchain. So this is what we're going to focus on today and this is what we're going to be analyzing. Uh, the address of contracts or accounts are encoded on 160 bits. 
and each of them either correspond to a user or an actual contract. So that's all you call uh, a contract by providing those addresses. And the EVM itself is operating on uh, registers that are 256 bits. Uh, they don't really have registers. We're gonna see like in the next slide how they actually work with registers. It's more like a virtual stack which is replacing registers compared to like a traditional architecture. So this is basically what a smart contract look like. As you can see, like this one is very short. It's probably like, I don't know, a 40 line of codes. And here is just like the uh, smart contract for a coin. So at the beginning you can see it as like the uh, balance for each account and uh, three functions. So each function is responsible uh, for specific function, uh, including one to send money. And on the right, basically once you compile that uh, smart contract, it's gonna look like the uh, following piece of uh, bytecode. And once you compile, it also generates what we call the ABI, so the interface to call functions from a contract. Uh, it's basically like a JSON interface. And the third interesting thing is when you call a contract, if you want to call a specific function, so like uh, instead of like giving the address of the function, you give the hash of the function, which is uh, computed dynamically. And we're gonna see how that hash is being uh, computed. So regarding the uh, memory management of the EVM, like I was saying, so there is like three main types of uh, memory types. The first one is the actual stack, which is where we have our pseudo registers. So every time a new instruction is being called or every time we're calling a third party contract, the operations are gonna be done on that actual stack where we have our 256 bits registers. Uh, it has a limited uh, size of 1024 entries. So we're gonna see like also there's some issues around that. So now it had been fixed in the EVM, but in the earlier, uh, early version of the EVM, uh, you could actually like trigger that uh, maximum uh, number of entries of elements inside the stack and uh, no exception would be generated. So that could also like uh, create uh, potential security issues. Uh, then we have like two, uh, main types, uh, two main types of memory, uh, storage, which is persistent. So that's where you would uh, store information like the balance of an account or uh, all those things. Um, it cannot be enumerated. You would pass the uh, hash to retrieve the entry and you can easily recognize access to those, uh, uh, to the uh, persistent uh, memory type by looking at the uh, instruction, s store and s load. And then the uh, last one is uh, the volatile one. So every time you're dealing with uh, a buffer, doing a string manipulation uh, action, then you would, uh, so it, you, you still work with like 256 bits uh, values and you can easily recognize it internally uh, by the uh, mstore and mload instructions. So now the most important things uh, we need to know when at least when we do reverse engineering regardless of the architecture is how to recognize basic blocks. Uh, so in that context, in the context of smart contracts to recognize basic blocks, it's quite easy. Um, the beginning of each basic block, most of the time, like in 80, 90% of cases, we start with the instruction jump dest, and that would mark the actual beginning of the basic block, and then uh, the uh, basic block would end with a jump instruction. So same thing like regular architecture, you have uh, regular jumps and conditional jumps. The, in the case of the EVM, they have to push uh, the destination address first, and then uh, they call the instruction, unlike on x86, where you basically have the offset and the jump in the actual same uh, instruction. So in some cases, there is like some stack manipulation uh, operations with the uh, swap, duplication, push and pop uh, instructions, which can make the uh, destination harder to retrieve. So that's why like in the tool, uh, what we're gonna see in the uh, following slides, is in many cases, we actually have to emulate 
that uh, specific um, those uh, stack um, operations. Then we can uh, retrieve the actual uh, destinations. Most of the actual instructions, so as you can imagine, would contain most of the uh, common operations, such as the arithmetic operation, comparison, uh, bit field operation, but also uh, information regarding like the environment block. So in that case, like if you're contract, you call another contract. So like the equivalent of the PEB on Windows, if you, uh, if you want to look at it this way, with information on the sender, the number of arguments, they would be contained in those uh, information blocks. And then all the memory uh, operations, but also an instruction which is like the uh, SHA-3, uh, which is outcoded as an actual instruction. So there is also like deprecated uh, hash, uh, hashing uh, algorithm like uh, SHA-2, but they're not uh, outcoded in it. They're actually, uh, they're using like third party uh, smart contracts to do that. Um, just for the actual syntax, so most of the operations uh, I'm gonna be describing are gonna be following the uh, uh, EVM, uh, the follow, uh, following uh, EVM pseudocode to make it easier to read. Because as you can see, like uh, if you look at the actual bytecode, it's like push, push, add. So it's like free instructions, so it's not very convenient to read. So uh, I'm just gonna like translate it as add two and one. So in that case, as you can imagine, so you push those two values on the stack and the result will be stored in the first entry of the stack. So here, one plus two would be three. So there is also like uh, some uh, interesting instruction, so call and delegate call. So basically that they allow you not to call like uh, some specific code inside the actual smart contract, but you can call an outside smart contract. So a third party smart contract if you want. And that's actually where most of the interesting thing is happening because in terms of exposure, it makes it harder to understand what's going on with the code with the exception of uh, four outcoded contracts. So regarding the um, public key recovery, the J2 function, the uh, RIPEMD160, and the identity function. So those are like the um, four contracts that are actually uh, outcoded. So, and every time you uh, call a contract, so if you see you push uh, the parameters you want to pass to the actual smart contract, the, uh, you give like the buffer where you want to re uh, like recover all the information. And also there is something called like a gas limit that you can allocate every time you call like a third party contract so you're sure it does not cost you too much to execute. Um, one of the interesting Instruction is uh, called da data load. So called data load is gonna read the environmental information block where basically you can read the actual parameters. So every time you're calling a function, that's basically where you will pass all those parameters. So the first four bytes usually would contain the hash of the function you want to call, which is what uh, we're gonna see like uh, in the next slide. And then you have like the following parameters. So in that case, if you have a simple function like foo which is gonna do an addition between two variables. You're gonna have like two called to uh, call data load at the offset four and 24 because remember we're working with uh, 256 bits uh, values and then you're just gonna have like a piece of code like that where you're just gonna add uh, both values. So because uh, values are using like very large uh, bit encoding, so for instance addresses, like I said, they are encoded on 160 bits. Uh, it makes it like very easy to recognize where they are and to do some type discovery. So for instance here, for addresses, uh, you would often see an uh, end operation on uh, those uh, values. Um, sometimes they're gonna use like some more complex compiler optimization, like the one here, where basically it's gonna use uh, like an exponential uh, division, an, uh, an exponential operation uh, to uh, retrieve the actual address. So when we're gonna have to decompile that part, we're just gonna like display the address. So we won't have to show all the uh, intermediary operation. Now, 
if we look at the actual bytecode, every time you compile a contract, it's gonna be divided in two categories. The first category is gonna be the preloader code. The preloader code is the code which is gonna be executed every time you call the contract. Um, that could have been like removed for optimization purpose because if you have to imagine that every time you compile a smart code, it's gonna be in your blockchain and since it's like very similar to shell coding uh, in, in the 90s where you want to count how many like uh, bytes you need for your shell code, uh, it, you would assume to be the same thing for actual uh, blockchain contracts. Uh, so the preloader usually is always the same. It's mainly gonna be used to copy the actual code in memory, uh, which is like the uh, runtime code of the contract. And the runtime code of the contract is where the actual magic is happening, where all uh, your user-defined functions are gonna be. So this is basically what uh, the uh, like the uh, disassembled bytecode of a smart contract look like. So in that uh, case here, this is the preloader. So here you see a call to have uh, an instruction called code copy, which is where it's gonna copy the actual uh, runtime code in memory. And this is the actual runtime code. So the runtime code itself contains a dispatcher. The uh, dispatcher is like basically like a big switch, a big switch where you have the hash of each function and for each uh, function is gonna redirect it to the actual user defined function. So in that specific scenario, we have like two functions, so double and triple, and each value you see so in yellow and in pink are bas basically the ashes of uh, uh, double and triple. So, and as you can see, each uh, function starts with a jump dust to indicate the beginning of a basic block. How do you compute an actual function hash? So it's basically like a, a shaft-free of the function name and the different uh, parameter type. So like, so if you remember previously I said whenever you compile a contract, it's gonna generate a JSON interface for the actual contract. So if you take the function name and the type of each parameter, and uh, so if you do like a shaft free of it and you keep like the first uh, four bytes, then you're gonna get the hash which is gonna be used for the actual uh, user defined function. Um, so this is uh, the optimization we often see every time it's trying to recover the hash. So there's a division because it's just gonna keep like the first 32 bits of that value. Um, at the end, so what we see is uh, a conditional jump. So it's doing a comparison of the uh, values and if they're equal, uh, then it's gonna jump on it. So it's kind of like a very dirty way to do it. Like I was saying, like each instruction is like taking so much space. Uh, they could have like architecture, like the actual like VM in a better way. So I'm really thinking that Ethereum now, even though it's interesting because they're like the actual like first platform uh, to leverage that concept of like software layer with smart contracts, uh, I would not be surprised to see like a better like platform appearing in the near future with a better set of instruction. So. With the tool, you can actually generate a control flow graph. So we have the static and the emulated uh, view. So the static view, uh, as you can see, like some nodes are orphans, so we don't know where they come from. And on the right, uh, we emulate the actual stack, stack operation uh, for each jump, jump destination. Because like I was saying, in some cases, so like those weird optimization where basically the uh, destination would be at the very beginning of uh, the uh, basic block and then they would do a bunch of like uh, operations which is like the main uh, core of the function and then it would just like swap the actual stack to recover the destination address. So unless you actually emulate the code, it's pretty uh, difficult to uh, retrieve uh, from static analysis. Uh, so this is uh, the actual like pseudocode of the dispatcher I was just describing. So 
here. So uh, our two functions is multiplying the actual uh, input parameter by two, and then the other function is multiplying by three. So the dispatcher, like I was saying, is basically like a big uh, switch where they would extract like the first uh, four bytes of the actual input data, and then for each uh, case, we're gonna have the equivalent of our user-defined function. So like the actual output for that actual uh, smart contract would be what we see on the right. Um, so as you can see, like even for like some very basic functions, like the actual like Ethereum virtual machine is doing a lot of extra operations that could have been like uh, optimized. Uh, I would assume it will happen at some point unless they are totally changing the actual architecture of the EVM or if someone just comes up with a better um, virtual machine architecture. So here, let's uh, have a look at uh, some uh, emulated uh, piece of code. So here, 